I was kind of shocked by the, by the remembrance, but you realize that it was about a year ago uh, that, um, that uh, Billy Graham uh, went home to be with the Lord. And uh, it was in February, in fact, where a uh, motorcade uh, bore the body of Billy Graham away from Black Mountain, North Carolina, to, uh, to his final resting place in Charlotte. What's fascinating is that, that eight months later, um, a missionary pastor named Andrew Brunson made the trip in reverse. Uh, he made his way back home to Black Mountain, North Carolina, after having been imprisoned in, in Turkey for 21 months. And I don't know how familiar you are with his story. Um, you know, the little bits that I know, I'll just fill you in just a little bit, because it, it, it's really important as we begin to think about what it is that God has to say for us tonight. Um, but if you're not familiar with his story, uh, Andrew Brunson grew up in a Christian family. In fact, uh, he grew up mostly in Mexico City. His parents were missionaries. And um, he went to a Christian college in the Midwest in Illinois uh, named Wheaton College, and it was there that he met his wife, Noreen. Uh, the two of them uh, were very interested in becoming missionaries, and one of the reasons that they were interested is because both of them spoke several languages fluently. Uh, that might always tip you off, you know. <laughs> If you've got facility and languages, uh, maybe God's calling you to do something globally. Um, but both of them came to this point in their college career where they, they said that, you know what, they really wanted to invest their lives in, in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in, in some place that had very little Christian influence. You know, it, it's, there's, there's all kinds of different ministries out there. What, what they wanted was one where, well, there weren't just very many Christians around. Them. And so, in, in reality, they, they ended up in in Turkey, and uh, in fact, they ended up in a city that used to be known as Smyrna. If you've uh, read your uh, Bible recently, you looked at the book of Revelation, you know that there's a, a city named Smyrna there. And uh, here's what it says in Revelation 3.20. It says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Uh, behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Not the most encouraging word, granted. Uh, but that's what he was saying to the people who were in this church in, in Smyrna. Uh, Smyrna now is, is not called Smyrna anymore. And uh, I'd have to ask Kelly and Sherry for the actual pronunciation. But I think it's something like East Um And in, uh, in 1993, Andrew Brunson and his wife began working, planning a church in uh, that town. And, uh, and they called it Resurrection Church. Now... We, we live in a city where I think at last count there's more than 30 churches in La Habra. Um, in the whole country of, uh, of Turkey, there's about 150 Christian gatherings in that country, and Resurrection Church was just one of those. Church has about 40 members in it, and uh, what they were known for was handing out Bibles and hosting prayer meetings. Um, that is until a conflict started in Syria. And when that happened, uh, the burden on uh, both uh, Andrew's heart and uh, the people in his church was that they needed to do something with this you know, great human you know, tragedy that was occurring around them. And so Resurrection Church found a way to be able to go and, and help uh, provide some aid for these refugees who were uh, along the Syrian border. And they provided them shelter and you know, typical kinds of aid things. And, and I think it was interesting. One of the Resurrection Church members said, well, you know, uh, it was just perfectly normal that we would do this to help them. That's a good response. Right? They thought it was good, and it's just a normal part of being a Christian that they would pass on some kind of aid. Now, these activities that they were involved in, this helping of these people, was not illegal. Um, but the authorities would later use this activity to construct a case against Andrew Brunson claiming that he was sympathizing with the terrorists and he was an enemy of the state. Uh, but nothing really could be further from the truth because Andrew Brunson loved Turkey. Uh, in fact, uh, he so much loved Turkey, he and his wife Noreen, that they planned to retire there. They had, uh, they had purchased an apartment. They were working on trying to get permanent visas to be able to stay in the country forever. That's how much they loved Turkey. Uh, they weren't trying to subvert Turkey. Um, and so... The process, though, of trying to get those visas became a, a difficult process. The political instability in the country was kind of delaying that process. Um, but one day they got a call. The call asked them to, uh, to show up at some you know, governmental authority's office. And to, to them, they thought that 
they were just being called in to maybe get some questions about this visa thing or you know find out what the next step is something along that line uh, but they were completely shocked and totally blindsided when in reality they were arrested when they walked into that office uh, Marine was uh, released in about 13 days, uh, but Andrew went to prison. And many of you know something, I think, of his case because it was all over the news, you know, in our nation, internationally it was there. Um, uh, eventually, Andrew Brunson was charged with espionage, um, but people around the world were praying. And the United States government got involved. They were trying to send in negotiators to try to, to work for his release from this, but, but all to no avail. Uh, Brunson says that the first year in prison literally broke him as a person. He, he said he was fearful, he was anxious, he lost 50 pounds. He spent really, when I, he said, when I think about it, uh, that first year when I was in prison, he said, I spent most of that year curled up in a fetal position on the floor of my cell um, and, and suffered ter you know, horrible side effects of, of PTSD. Finally then, uh, his trial began, and uh, after the charges were read against him, uh, he delivered a, a six-hour rebuttal to the three judges that, uh, that were sitting there, and he delivered it in perfect Turkish. And he denied all the accusations against him. He said this, he says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. My purpose here in Turkey is to tell people about Jesus and to help disciple those who believe in him. I have not been involved in any illegal activity. It took six hours of lengthy discussion to talk about that. Really, that trial was a roller coaster. Uh, there, there were moments where, where deals were made and everything looked like it was going to be good and it looked like Brunson was going to be released and then before you know it, everything just fell apart. And you're back down to thinking maybe he's going to end up spending his entire life in prison. And all of that was true until suddenly uh, there were some of the prosecution's key witnesses who uh, took the stand and they actually changed their testimony. And so now they were actually in favor of Brunson as opposed to, you know, being opposed to Brunson. And as a result of that, the judge had to really reconsider what was going on. He eventually issued his verdict. And he declared that Andrew Brunson was guilty on terrorism charges. He sentenced him to three years, one month, and 15 days in prison. He fined him, but then the judge quickly released him for the time that had been served. And within a very matter of minutes, probably, within a couple of hours anyway, uh, Brunson and his wife were boarding a flight to Germany, and they would eventually make their way to Washington, D.C., Andrew Brunson says that his story is something like a story of Joseph in the Old Testament, where, where he was accused uh, and, and punished for doing something that he never did. He says, unless loving the Turkish people is a crime. He said he admittedly struggled with loving his enemies who had falsely accused him and falsely imprisoned him and persecuted him. He was able to survive the ordeal, though, he says, and, and he tells this is the reason. He says, the reason that I could do all of this was because every single day I quoted a passage from the Sermon on the Mount. And it was this one. In Matthew 5, 10, Jesus said, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, if you were here a few weeks ago when Steve Borgia introduced us to this particular beatitude, this is the last of the beatitudes, and uh, we're going to look at this one for a couple of weeks at least. Uh, but, but when Steve was introducing it to us, he was, he was talking to us about, you know, kind of the nature of persecution and how persecution works. He talked about how in the time of Jesus, for instance, Jesus certainly knew persecution. And he was persecuted often by the, by the Pharisees, uh, those, you know, legalists who had established certain laws. And they basically decided that if anybody violated any of the laws that they had made, then that person was deserving of, of you know, punishment, of, of some kind of persecution. 
And, and so Steve talked about some of the, the rules that they made up. I was, happened to be looking at a source recently, and, and uh, it was talking about how in the Jewish Mishnah, uh, there are thousands of rules contained in, in 4,000 little compact paragraphs. Thousands of rules that the Pharisees made up in just a, in a short amount of writing, really. And, and one of them that caught my eye was, uh, you know, we all know that Jewish people are supposed to eat unleavened bread, you know, for Passover. We, we, we understand that. Um, but did you know that there, were, there are actually laws about that whole situation? Uh, for instance, uh, you know, when should they eat it? Uh, obviously, that's the easy question. Uh, that was, they're supposed to eat it at Passover. Um, but they're supposed to eat it between nightfall and midnight. There's laws about that. You can't, 1201, you know, in the morning, can't be eating, you know, unleavened bread there. Uh, there, there are laws about how much they should eat. And so the Pharisees decided that, oh, you know, about one or two olives worth of unleavened bread is more than sufficient. You know, you're not there to feast. So they created a law about that. Uh, they had laws about in what position you should be in order to eat the unleavened bread. And so you should be leaning to the left as you eat the unleavened bread. And, and then uh, they also had a law for the length of time that, that it should take you to eat those two olives worth of, uh, you know, unleavened bread. They figured that, uh, you know, 10 minutes certainly is, is plenty of time for you to be able to in, eat that and get that ingested. So, I mean, the, the Pharisees nitpicked everything to death. They had, they had thousands and thousands of laws. And they held each of them up and said, you know, if you, if you disobey even one of these, then, then you're guilty. Uh, you certainly rightfully can be persecuted. I mean, just look what they did to Jesus. How they persecuted him. And, and, when, and when Steve was talking about this, uh, this idea of persecution, you know, he, um, he mentioned some more, you know, relatively current, uh, you know, examples of that. He talked about Isabella Chow, a student at UC Berkeley who was given death threats because as a member of student government, she refused to, you know, uh, agree with something that the Berkeley, you know, student body was, uh, was going to protest. It was some, uh, you know, some declaration or directive by the president that they were going to protest that had LGBTQ plus, you know, uh, influences. And, uh, and she was getting death threats you know, because she refused to, to side along that. He talked about uh, Guillermo Gonzalez at my alma mater, Iowa State, who, uh, as a scientist, had come to the conclusion that from his research, he really believed that the universe had a designer. And as a result of that, you know, he was unable to get tenure at that institution. He can't teach there any longer. The truth of the matter is there's all kinds of persecution. There's persecution uh, all over the entire world in different aspects. But, but here's what I want you to learn tonight. One simple principle I want you to grab hold of, and that is this, that not all persecution falls into the category of what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. All persecution is not the kind of persecution that brings you kingdom of blessings. There's all kinds of persecution, but not all of it is what Jesus was talking about. So just because we think we're persecuted, just because we feel a little uncomfortable in some particular situation, uh, that does not mean uh, that we are being persecuted according to, the, to the, the idea that Jesus was talking about. Reality is that the, the reason behind the persecution is the key. It's how you can really figure it out. Why are you being persecuted? I, I think it's real interesting. There was a, there was a pastor in England, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, in the previous century, and he said this, he said, uh, there is no beatitude that has been so frequently misunderstood and misapplied as this particular beatitude. I mean, when he looks at it, he realizes that, you know, we're not just talking here about general persecution. Um, he, he, we're really talking about persecution for the sake of righteousness. That's what Jesus said is what will give you those kingdom blessings. There can be a lot of reasons for us getting persecuted, but they may not have anything to do with righteousness whatsoever. Let me give you a few examples. How many of you, when you were uh, you know, first saved, uh, became this zealot uh, for the cause of Christ? <laughs> 
And so every single person that you ran into, your family members, your closest friends, uh, you just bombarded them, you know, with the gospel. And, and, and you were desperate to, uh, to try to convince them that they needed to come to Jesus Christ. Uh, but then you find your family and friends kind of distancing themselves from you, and the question would have to be asked, was it because of what you were saying or how you were saying it? You see, there's a huge difference between those two kinds of persecution. You could be so overzealous and so really uncaring about someone else and more about your agenda uh, that it causes people to back away. And that's not necessarily the persecution Jesus was talking about. I mean, if you share the gospel by telling people what they need to believe rather than even listening to them, and as we've talked about before, question evangelism is a great, great method of doing that, right? Uh, so that you can find that, you can find connection points with people. Uh, because otherwise, what it is, is, is you're just coming and you're delivering, you know, your four spiritual laws or whatever gospel presentation you want to do. You're just trying to check it off a box. You're just trying to get to the end of it. But you're really not interested in the dialogue. You're really not interested in some kind of relationship uh, evangelism, uh, you're, just, you're just trying to get a notch in your belt. If you get persecuted for that, that's not the kind of persecution that Jesus was talking about. I mean, if you act like a proud know-it-all rather than a humble follower of Jesus, and people start to ostracize you, you realize, don't you, that that's not being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. If you're judgmental and if you're like a Pharisee and you hold up some standard and you somehow forget that you don't measure up to all the other standards that there are out there, uh, but in your self-righteousness, you're trying to persuade someone, well, if they turn their back on you and they come against you, it's not the persecution that Jesus was talking about. This was the persecution for the sake of righteousness. I mean, I mean if you come across as a, you know, an angry, uh, defensive person in the midst of a conversation with somebody, and, and you know, there, there you are with your you know, face red and blood vessels bulging from your neck, and you're calling them names, and you're shouting at them, and there's anger everywhere. I can guarantee you that if they don't like you as a result of that, it may not at all be because you're being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Could be because all you are is an angry person, trying to convince them of some absolute truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you speak the truth without love and people dismiss you, you're not being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. If you make your faith more about your politics than about Jesus, careful. Because if you get blasted on Facebook because of some comment that you made, that's not being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. If you do weird things and people make fun of you, it's not necessarily being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. I mean, on the way here, it's, you know, I don't know how far it is, two miles to my house. I'm, I'm driving through the intersection of Beach and La Habra Boulevard, and there's some guy out there. He's dressed fairly nicely. He's got some headphones on. He's rocking out in the, in the center divider, mind you with some kind of big cross, and I don't even know what it said on it, because everybody was beeping at him because he wasn't paying attention to which way traffic was going. He was being an absolute nuisance to traffic. God, oh yeah, great. <laughs> you saw him too. <laughs> uh, the people blasting their horns, that, I hope he doesn't go home thinking to himself, oh, I was persecuted today for the sake of righteousness. No, you persecuted today because you're weird. <laughs> I mean, I remember a group of Christians way, I don't know how many years, many years ago now, who, who were absolutely convinced that Jesus was going to come back on a certain date. And so they all gathered together on some kind of hilltop out in Arizona. And in the run up to their supposed date, they thought to themselves, I'm going to really stick it to the world. I'm going to max out all my credit cards. So then when Jesus takes me away, ah, well then when Jesus didn't show up and all of a sudden the authorities are uh, hounding them for payment on their credit cards, easy for them to say, oh, I'm being persecuted. I'm not being persecuted. That was a stupid thing to do. 
I mean, if you break the law and you get arrested, it's not necessarily because you're being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. You might disagree with me on this one, but, but years ago, there was a group called Operation Rescue, a very, uh, you know, a very public anti-abortion group. And I'm really anti-abortion. I'm not saying that at all. I think the basic idea of their cause is good, but their methodology was really troublesome. Uh, because all they would do is they, they would go and gather you know, in front of some kind of abortion clinic, violating the laws of gathering in front of a place like that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they'd get arrested. And I remember in our church there was a guy who went to one of their rallies and happened to be one of the people that got arrested. And, and I remember conversing with him after that, and he was recounting to me this incident that occurred. And, and there, was in his, there was in his heart a sense of pride that I got arrested because that's persecution. And I thought, you know what? That's not persecution. That's not persecution for the sake of righteousness. Uh, that's, that, you're, you're being arrested because you broke a law. It's very different than what Jesus was talking about. Not all persecution is persecution for the sake of righteousness. I like how Martin Lloyd Jones again says it. He said, you know, we can bring endless suffering upon ourselves. We can create difficulties for ourselves which are quite unnecessary because we have some rather foolish notion of witnessing or testifying or because in a spirit of self-righteousness we are so slow to understand the difference between being offensive because of our particular makeup and temperament and causing offense because we are righteous. I like how Steve said it when he introduced this beatitude. He said this. He says, if you're persecuted for doing the right things, you'll be blessed in the kingdom of God. And that's really it. It's about being, it's, it's about being persecuted for doing the right things. Here, let me say it another way. Uh, the only persecution that, that counts as for what Jesus is talking about is when we get persecuted because we are being too much like Jesus. We're loving God too much. We're loving others too much. We're loving those in the family of faith. We're loving those outside too much. Too much like Jesus. And then when we get persecuted for that, now we're talking. Now we can start talking about being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Because Jesus is the ultimate example, isn't he, of righteousness? The sinless Son of God who did all things rightly. When we're following close in His steps, inevitably there will come times where there's conflict that, inter that interjects itself. But not because of us. It's really because of us being like Him. And so when we're persecuted because... We refuse to bow in worship to a secular idol. Now we're talking about persecution for the sake of righteousness. When we refuse to be silent because Jesus commands us to go and to preach the gospel to all the nations. Uh, now we're talking about being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. When we get jailed because we're healing people on the Sabbath. Now let's talk about being persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Because that's what it's like. It's when we look so much like Jesus. We smell like Jesus. We act like Jesus. We talk like Jesus. It's inevitably going to find conflict. And that's then suddenly now we're talking about the kind of persecution that is for the sake of righteousness that leads to the blessing of the kingdom. I'm pretty convinced uh, that... Um, that we as a church are, are heading for days of more persecution. Now, we, we haven't experienced it literally, I could really say at all. In all my years in the church, I don't, uh, we haven't really been persecuted here at home. I know brothers and sisters who have been. I know some, some African pastors who used to be part of our church who are, you know, in Nigeria and places like that right now who, who, you know, regularly are afraid of the Muslim, you know, rebels that are going to come through. They're not nice when they do. 
There's persecution in the world. I don't think we're going to be immune to it. And so it's really for that reason that I want to spend a couple more weeks on this passage. Because I barely just touched it. I, I got through like the first sentence of this. Right? Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of God. So we're going to pick this up. And we'll, uh, we'll explore more of those uh, details in that passage before we leave this. But uh, it's now 558 we're trying to start our meeting shortly after 6. And so here's, here's the, this little break that we're going to take. Maybe three minutes, five minutes. If you need to go, we're glad you were here. Um, hope to see you again next week. Just uh, You can make your way out. If you're going to stay, though, do, do us a favor, will you? Can you move to the, more to the front rows so that we can actually converse with one another? Steve Borgia, who's the president of our Board of Elders, is going to be uh, uh, kind of chairing this little meeting. So let's pray together, and then we'll stand and make our movements, and, and we'll get started. Our goal is to try to be done at, you know, 620 or something like that, uh, so uh, we can go from there. So let's, uh, let's stand together and pray. Lord, when we start talking about persecution, in some ways it's an extremely foreign concept to most of us. And I think Lloyd-Jones was right when he said there's a lot of misunderstanding and misapplication of this particular beatitude. I mean, it's just hard maybe to, for our minds to get wrapped around the idea that blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. How do blessing and persecution go together? But when we look at the life of our Lord Jesus... The sinless Son of God, perfect righteousness. He was horribly persecuted. So we understand something of it. I, I pray, Lord, that you would help us, just in our own minds, to begin to understand what kind of persecution it is that you're talking about. Because not, not when somebody looks sideways at me or, you know, walks away from a conversation of one kind or another. It's, that's not necessarily it. So I pray that you'd help us to be really careful at understanding the kind of persecution that Jesus is talking about. Because there's incredible blessing that's associated with that. To, uh, to those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, the kingdom of God belongs. And so Lord, we come to you and we just open our hearts to you Lord, we, won't, we, we open ourselves to the work of the Spirit who's sanctifying us, working to chip away those rough edges in our lives that don't look like Jesus so that we can become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. But we know that the more we look like him, the more we should expect persecution. Help us, Lord, in the next couple of weeks to learn more about this gain a deeper understanding of it. Uh, because if the church finds itself, uh, in America anyway, in, in a place where we find ourselves persecuted, Lord, it's important for us to know this. So we're really preparing, Lord. Just like Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples when on that mountain, when he's giving this sermon, he talks about persecution. Huh. Who would have guessed? And so, Lord, uh, we want to be those kind of disciples. We're not looking for persecution. But the more we look like Jesus, we'll find it. And so I pray, Lord, that you would, you would just open our hearts and minds uh, to think carefully on this subject. Lord, we pray right now for uh, the meeting that's to follow. We thank you, God, for the incredible blessings of this, uh, uh, this last year. So many wonderful and good things, all because of you, Lord, and because of your people who are gathered here in this place. And Lord, we want to know where you want us to go next. And so uh, our, my prayer is, God, you'd uh, empower Steve to, as usual, deliver clair with clarity the things that we need to know. And that you'd be glorified as a result of uh, not only our time in the word, but uh, this time when we meet together as a family and talk about a little bit of family business.
So we bless your name, Lord. We're glad that we, you are uh, in our lives, moving to make us more and more like your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.